Ten years ago, when you were here, I mean, this was a, a year before the crisis happened, before the Lehman collapse. What's the biggest change you see now versus then? I mean, the financial system in the United States has changed radically. Uh, leverage has been reduced enormously. Risk has been reduced enormously in the banking system. I, you know, I think the regulators in the United States actually did a very good job post-crisis. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, for the first time in all the years that I've covered bank stocks, I can honestly say I think the financial system in the United States is safe. Yeah, you said you're sleeping a little bit better at night yes. these days. But uh, you know, do you think banks globally are, are generally in better shape now? I mean, you talk about how banks were too big to fail back then. We see the balance sheets of many of the American banks have now ballooned as well. Chinese banks are the largest in the world. Do you think we fixed the structural issues now? I can only for the speak next about downturn? the United States being in far better shape than it was. I'd say Europe is better, but not good enough. I think Canada is okay, mm -hmm. but I think Canada is going to have some issues with their housing market. I can't really speak to Asia. Mm. Uh, what about the human element of what really led to the crisis? I mean, the greed factor of all this. I think it was Whitney Tulson recently that said, it seems like we're seeing a little bit more sanity and, and stupid in what we saw back then. Do you agree? I think the incentive structures back then were warped. The people who ran securitization desks were compensated purely on volume. You know, one of the things I like to say about the financial crisis that we learned is that incentives trump ethics every time, mm -hmm. and the incentives were poor. They're better now, but they were very poor back then. You mentioned Europe can, can do a little bit better. You've, you've been pretty negative about some of these European banks. Uh, what are your thoughts now about Deutsche Bank and the others, which I think they're still kind of in the thick of their problems right now? You know, Deutsche Bank has real profitability issues. They haven't spent money on technology in a very, very long time. It's, they're probably undercapitalized. I think they'll probably raise capital again next year. Um, Deutsche Bank's a problem bank. I think it has to shrink dramatically. You're seeing more consolidation, you think, in, in, in some of these European banks? Or? I, don't, I can't speak to Europe whether there'll be consolidation or not. I, I think there's definitely going to be consolidation in the United States, mm -hmm. which is driven by uh, how much companies like J.P. Morgan are spending on technology, which is about 10 to $11 billion a year, yeah. versus much smaller amounts to the regional banks. So the regions are going to have to merge to bulk up. I know you don't look too much into China now, but what, what do you think is, you know, if, if you talk about excessive leverage, is that where we're going to see the root of it now in this time of, of the cycle? I mean, what do you think China is in the cycle at the moment? I'm not going to comment on China. <laughs> I, I haven't studied China in a very long time, okay. and I don't think it would be appropriate for me to talk about it. Um, Talk a little bit more about the biggest long opportunities right now. I, I mean, you're very positive about the banks. I think tech is also one of your big sectors as well. I mean, what, what do you think is, is the biggest, I guess, opportunity for you in 2018? I think the biggest opportunity is that I think long short is making a comeback. There are more ways to make money on the long side and on the short side, whereas in the past it was purely on the long side since the crisis. Mm. So there's more volatility. I think the volatility is here to stay. And so running a hedge portfolio makes a lot more sense. What do you make of just, I know you're saying you're not looking anywhere in the fixed income space right now. Is it because you're seeing a little bit more further repricing on, on just how much higher yields can go? I think, look, QE is over. Rates are going up. I just don't see many opportunities in the bond market. I just really don't. I think, you know, call me in two years so we can talk. <laughs> well, what about what we've seen in, in the debt markets, I guess? I mean, there's statistics out there from the IMF recently that were saying U.S. debt to GDP projected to exceed that of Italy's by 2023. The threats to the global financial system are rising. The price of risky assets, they say. You know, the IMF was very bad <laughs> predicting stuff going into the crisis. Yeah. I don't pay particular attention to the IMF today. Um, I'm not what I like to, I'm not a deficit fetishist. Mm. So, for example, the U.S. debt to GDP today is around 110%. Maybe it'll be 120% in a few years or 130. Japan's is 240. Yeah. Who has lower China's rates? China's 300, right? Who has lower rates? So, you know, I, not that a deficit isn't a problem. The people who have been arguing about, complaining about deficits, they've been complaining about it for 30 years. Mm -hmm. And the only thing that's happened during that time is that the price of that risk has gone down, which is interest rates. So I think the onus is on them to show why the deficit's a problem. So do you think overall QE was, was effective? Or? Oh, QE was a failure. It was a failure. Why so? Well, you know, pre-QE, U.S. growth was 1.5% to 2%. Post QE, U.S. growth was one and a half to two percent. So, you know, it was a noble experiment. It didn't work. I think it didn't work 
because it gave corporations incentives to buy back stock mm -hmm. and it hurt consumers because they're not making any money by keeping their money in the bank. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't think Huey was a success at all. Your biggest short uh, play these days is, is it, you know, I know you said there's not many, but what would it be? Um, short Canadian financials, um, short Deutsche Bank, <laughs> uh, I'm sure short Wells Fargo. Um, and then there are a few there are there's select opportunities. I mean, I think there's yeah. you know the whole disruptor versus disruptee theme is going to last for a very long time. Yeah. And there are a lot of ways to play that both long and short. And, and of course, you've, you've talked a little bit about hedge funds in general and where they are going. And you in particular has rejected the bit of the two and twenty fee structure. Tell us a little bit more about just in terms of your lower fee products right now. How are, how are those performing? Well, I have one product. It has a much lower fee structure. It has daily transparency. It has daily liquidity. Mm -hmm. It has a flat fee, no carry. Um, it's performing quite well. I mean, I'm not allowed to talk about the performance, sure. but uh, the correlation to the S&P is quite low. If you see you know, the competition when it comes to these quant funds or you know, uh, these interest in all these quant strategies right now, do you think that that actually puts a little bit more pressure on, on fees and, and getting more into the I think the, space? the pressure on fees in the hedge fund will be relentless, and 10 years from now, the fees will be significantly lower.